Senator Sass, thanks so much for, for joining the show. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me on. I'm grateful for the invite. Okay, so Senator Sass, I do want to ask you about your book, but first, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the news of the day. I just want to get your basic take on how we should be looking at this situation in which a congressional candidate in Montana has apparently body slammed a reporter. It's been confirmed basically by a Fox News report. Uh, you know, what should, I think obviously everybody of goodwill can look at this and say this is ridiculous, but how should Republicans be treating this? Because now they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. They're in the middle of an election. Uh, they don't want to see a Democrat win a seat. How do you think Republicans ought to be treating this? Yeah, so I've been in uh, commitments all morning, back to back, so I know almost nothing current on it except for just the, the top line fact of what happened last night. And it seems to me pretty obvious that if you are seeking a job as a public servant, uh, one of your most fundamental duties is to teach American civics. And since the First Amendment is the beating heart of the American experiment and of American civics, um, that means many, many, many things. But one of the most basic things the First Amendment means is you don't body slam a reporter. Um, <laughs> you, you celebrate the First Amendment. Well, I appreciate your, your candor on that, Senator Sass. I think one of the big problems is obviously that if leadership in both parties doesn't say the same thing that you do, then what you end up with is sort of prisoner's dilemma. I'm going to explain that a little bit to the listeners. Uh, you end up with a sort of prisoner's dilemma where people feel, okay, I have to pick the, the second worst choice, and obviously we're electing a congressman, we're not electing uh, a pastor, and that means that even if somebody does something that I find abhorrent, he's going to be a better legislator than somebody else, but it, it, the leadership of both parties needs to stand together and say that when, and it's a, it's a problem because they won't do it, that when people act like this, that they should not be seated, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, so I, I'm shooting straight with you that I've had zero uh, conversations with anybody about where any of the leaders are on an issue like that or whether or not there's been a call for that joint press conference. But let's just distinguish between short-term and long-term, because here's what I really care about. I get that in a short-term basis, all through life, people are often presented with choices that feel like a lesser of two evils discussion. That's not where I spend any of my energy. I spend all of my time and energy on this, which is what are we doing now to build a country where the American people will understand our shared narrative as a people and where there will be more public trust five and 10 and 15 and 20 years from now, because we are not one election away from the eschaton. We're not one election away from election the guy who will drive some majority that's going to pass all their great legislation and they're going to bring about utopia. Um, America is centered in the local communities where people work and worship and where they're designing the next great app and where they're persuading people to join the Rotary Club. And politics is to provide a framework for that. And right now, our politics is so lame and boring and stupidly short-sighted that it always feels like people think they're trying to make the lesser of two evils choice that will bring about heaven on earth. It's not common via the city. I'm, I'm talking to you from D.C., mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, this city is filled with people who are just not interesting enough to project your grand hopes and dreams on. And so I, I think that one of the first duties of all politicians is to announce that politics isn't the center of life. And Senator Sass is one of the things we love so much about you. So your new book, which I really want to get to, The Vanishing American Adult, Our Coming of Age Crisis and How to Rebuild a Culture of Self-Reliance. It's debuting at number three on the New York Times bestseller list for nonfiction. And uh, this is actually a book, folks. I mean, it's not just a politician wrote a memoir and now you should go buy it because the politician needs to make money and put his kids through college. Although I assume that Senator Sass would like to put his kids through college with the money. But I think that the, the, the book itself is actually an important look at why it is that our common culture is eroding. We talk a lot on the show, Senator Sass, about the, the, social, the, the social capital uh, that used to undergird American society. And that's basically what your book is about, correct? Exactly right. Yeah, it's a hundred. Social capital is the term we should have in screaming lights uh, in these conversations because that's what's eroding, and then all the politics are dysfunctional downstream from that uh, poisoned river. Uh, and so I, I think that first of all, this book is a hundred percent not about politics. It's ninety nine percent not about policy. Um, it's it, the tiny point that it touches on policy is recognizing that education needs to be radically reformed, and there's going to be different kinds of job training uh, in the future when people are disrupted out of work and jobs at 40 and 45 and 50 and 55 years old. But the vast majority of the book is about exactly what you flag, which is social capital. The American experiment recognizes that in a broken world, you're going to have a uh, structure, you're going to have order, you're going to have security, there's going to be restraint. But what we want, and the American founders wanted, and what I think the vast majority of the American people actually want, if you put the choice to them, is they want self-control, 
self-governance, self-discipline, self-restraint, not power and discipline and restraint coming from another or from a political center. And right now, this city, D.C., is so populated by folks whose only long-term thought is about their own incumbency that they come to think that politics are the center of life. Anybody who thinks that, pol- that politics are the center of life is not well-suited to be an American <laughs> politician. So, Senator Sess, I want to ask you a question that, that I was asked last night at Northwestern. I was speaking there about a lot of these same exact issues. And it's, I think, the hardest question for, for politicians particularly. And that is, it's easy to a certain extent to say, here's what we need to do if we're starting from scratch, right? You're, you're 20 years old, you're not married yet, and now you're planning your life. And I assume that your book is making the case that you need to get married, you need to bring your children up in a place where there is social capital, we need to make connections with each other at the local level, at our churches and community level, and it's a Tocquevillean sense. Um, but yep. what, do we, what do we do about the person who's already made a decision that takes them out of that? So you have a single mom, she's already made the decision that she, a bad decision, uh, that she was going to get pregnant out of wedlock, now she she has the baby, and she maybe doesn't have that that support network. What do we do about that? You know, I call on people to to provide charity, but for some people, they say that's not enough of an answer. Well, what do you think we ought to be doing about that? Yeah, it's a very fair question. So, you know, we live east of Eden. We live in a fallen world where things are broken, and we're all, in, in, my, in my worldview, we're not only all sinners, uh, we're also all sinned against. And so everybody's always got uh, grievances and pain, and some people have pain that's much more substantial than others of us have ever experienced. And so the first thing we need to do is have a shared understanding of what we can and can't accomplish in the world. And what you want is a world where people are finding meaning in their local community, where they have meaningful work, where they have families, where they have social capital, where they have friendships, where they have intergenerational relationships, where they have the time and space to wrestle through the really big and important questions questions, which are so much bigger than politics. And what we're really describing there is neighborhood. What you want people to have is neighborliness. You want them to have friendships. You want want them to have meaningful work. And so we need to start by admitting that there is scar tissue in the world, but scar tissue is often to be celebrated because scar tissue is the foundation of future character. There's healing and there's, there's repair, there's rebuilding that happens among neighbors and friends as they work through those problems together. Charles Murray sometimes uses the the line that government's job is to take the difficulty out of things. But you got to be clear about what things you want the government to take the difficulty out of versus not. I want the government to take the difficulty out of walking home from a restaurant late at night. I don't want there to be violence in anybody's neighborhood when they're walking home from a restaurant or walking home from work late at night. But I don't want the government to take the difficulty out of cleaning up puke from my six-year-old in the middle of the night. Because if the government tries to come into my house and solve that problem, what it'll actually do is create passivity in me. And it turns out, as I have three kids, 15, 13, 6, um, I've had many, many sleepless nights over the course of my life when my kids are sick in the middle of the night, and my wife and I are on the edge of arguing with each other about why the other one didn't do enough to prevent this stupid thing from happening, you know? Uh, why would you let your kid eat that, that <laughs> apple slice off the floor of the athletic arena? That's the food poisoning that made him sick. But you know what happened? When we had to together clean up that puke in the middle of the night, we have a shared experience that was the foundation of future love, future uh, healthy nostalgia, future character, and my kids? They feel that we care for them because we do, but we've demonstrated it at real moments in time. And so I think that you're flagging all of the brokenness of different neighborhoods and different social capital and different community. Government, we should talk about it because there are things that government should do to mitigate some of the suffering, but we first have to have a shared understanding that government can't possibly bring about utopia. Government won't be effective at helping us clean up uh, from a sick kid in the middle of the night. So we have to understand that government government is limited and bounded, then let's have a meaningful argument. I'll say one more thing here. I think it's important to distinguish between our commitments, your and mine, uh, to limited government and to small government, because you and I believe in both of them. But limited government is far more important than small government. Limited government is understanding that government is not utopian and that rights precede government. Government isn't the author or the source of our rights. Small versus medium-sized government should be what the debate is between the Republican and the Democratic Party. How much intervention should there be in the economy. And there could be Democrats who, if they would give a full-throated defense of limited government and then make their argument for medium-sized government, 
I might vote differently than they would, but we could stand together at the kind of press conference you're talking about mm-hmm. and reaffirm basic American values and virtues. And then we could argue about the stuff we vote on, but we'd recognize that the stuff that we're voting on is central. It's not ultimate theological, philosophical dreaming. And Senator Ben Sass, The Vanishing American Adult, terrific book. And Senator Sass, one of the few honest men left in Washington, D.C., really appreciate it, showing that, that you know, the, a phrase that is overused but under-understood, common sense still exists. Thanks so much, Senator Sass, for joining The Ben Shapiro Show. Really appreciate your time and appreciate everything you're doing. Thanks for being back, Ben. Have a great day.